Today, we're getting under the hood of Dr. Ru Chang, a mother, daughter, sister, wife, aunt, daughter-in-law, OBGYN physician, clinical researcher, therapeutics developer, women's health expert, leader, and passionate advocate for women and girls. Ru Chang is director of the Women's Health Innovations Team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where all lives have equal value. She leads a team focused on the development and adoption of high quality health products that address the needs of women and girls in low and middle income countries. Rue's career path divides traditional boundaries and classifications with a common thread of applying science and medicine to address health areas that prevent women from achieving their optimal health. As a board certified obstetrician gynecologist, she began her career in academic medicine as a clinical educator. After a mentor introduced her to clinical research, Rue saw the opportunity to drive impact on a bigger scale. She transitioned to the pharma industry and spent the next 15 years working in clinical development roles of increasing responsibility and leadership in women's health, which took her to Wyeth Pfizer, Bayer, and Johnson & Johnson. In her role at Johnson & Johnson, she developed public health initiatives aimed at the maternal mortality crisis in the U.S. and the associated inequities. In her current role as at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Rue draws upon all of her experience as a woman's health clinician, big pharma, R&D leader, and public health innovator. And throughout her career, Rue has brought her lived experiences as a female immigrant from a minority race facing and overcoming inequities, further fueling her passion to advocate for marginalized women. In her free time, Rue enjoys spending time with her family, global travel, and staying fit. The opinions expressed are Rue's own and not reflective of her employer. Oh, thanks so much, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Oh, I'm so thrilled to be talking to you. It happens to be Women's Health Month. It's a really important month. If it's okay, can we get going? So I'm originally from Taiwan. Um, I, I was born in Taiwan and I spent the first few years of my life there and I came to the U.S. Uh, when I was a toddler because my dad came to the U.S. to pursue graduate studies. It was actually right after the Chinese Exclusion Act in the U.S., but I think a lot of people from uh, Taiwan and other areas um, in Asia took the opportunity to come to the U.S. because they saw different kinds of opportunities that were available. So yeah, I joined, uh, you know, my mom and I came to the U.S. with my dad. So he was a graduate student in graduate student housing, <laughs> you know, living on my dad's graduate student stipend. And I remember my mom saying things like, you know, if at the end of the month, if we had $4 left over, that was a good month because that meant we had a few extra bucks to <laughs> get a soda or, or something or to, to treat ourselves to something. So um, I think I, you know, I always grew up with this very strong work ethic. And part of that, I think, is an immigrant mentality. There's this feeling that if you work really hard, the U.S. is a kind of place where you can get ahead and you can really change the course of your life. My dad was actually the first person in his family to go to college. And he, you know, went on to get a PhD. So he is very educated, especially compared to the other people in his family. As far as like getting into science, so my dad has a PhD in pharmacology. And so science was kind of part of the fabric of our everyday dinner time conversation. And we had a strong community of people uh, that we were surrounded by who were other young families who were graduate students in, in the field that my, my dad was in. And then as he began his first job and we settled down in the Midwest, I think for a lot of immigrants, science is easy to get into because it's less, the language skills required are less than, than perhaps humanities. And so for, for people who are, you know, smart and able to apply themselves like science and uh, some of those STEM areas are very popular. And actually, you know, STEM wasn't even a phrase when I was growing up. I knew I was good in science. And, you know, I love that now we have women in STEM and girls in STEM. I love all of that. I just remember growing up and being the only girl in my class. I didn't really think too much of it. I just thought it was normal and only came to learn later and had the realization later that maybe that's not normal. So um, every day is a journey for sure. And I'll be the first to say that I've not completed my journey. 
but I think science just became part of part of my life because it was something that I was very comfortable and familiar with. In the traditional cultures, like the ones I came from, you know, medicine is a highly respected field. And I think it just made sense. It was something I felt like I could do to contribute to, to our society and to, and to give back. I think that was also a concept that was instilled in me at a young age, just that we should try to give back to our community. And I remember my parents' own ways, we would, you know, host like uh, newer graduate students who are coming to the U.S. And like sometimes people would stay with us for extended periods of time. And we were always trying to help others in our community. So I think I kind of just kind of grew up with that thought process and, and ethics. So uh, that's that's the genesis. I think that's amazing. And I think it's interesting that you commented on the thinking that being the only girl in the class is normal. I think today we're looking at a world where we're looking at how do we normalize these conversations? So you go off to school with the intent to go into medicine. So what was your journey like as you moved forward? <sighs> Yeah, when I went to college, I went to Duke University and along with many other people who who begin as freshmen declare themselves to be pre-med. I said I was pre-med and there was a small group of us that's really stuck through it and we remain pre-med throughout. Many people change their minds along the way, of course. I really enjoyed the classes and the coursework and really I just really enjoyed college. It was so much fun and I got to, you know, people talk about the college experience and how it's educational, both in and outside of the classroom. Um, now I have kids who are college age, and those are things we talk about as they were thinking about where they wanted to go to school. And so through that, I think I just grew as a person and really appreciated the classmates and the friendships that I made along the way. But uh, yeah, I was pretty steadfast as far as being pre-med and then um, continued on to medical school and did a residency and then in obstetrics and gynecology. And I think it was really after I did my residency that I suddenly was left with a moment of now what, what am I going to do now? I'm, you know, like I've just put my head down and like just pedal to the metal, just really focused on getting through school and training. And, you know, for, for medicine, careers in medicine, it's a very established path. You know, like if you complete your prerequisites, you'll and take the MCAT, you'll go to med school. If you finish med school, you'll do a residency. If you finish your residency, you will be able to find some kind of employment as a physician. And so it was really at that point in time that I was suddenly like, oh, wow, there's a whole wide world out here and I need to think about what I want to do. I went into academic medicine because it was very familiar. I had trained in an academic setting, loved the idea of teaching, really enjoyed the people that I had trained with, the mentors and the attendings that I worked with. And so that was an easy transition I think after working in academic medicine, and I dabbled a little bit in private practice too, um, I went back to academic medicine. That's kind of when I had a little, a, a bit of an inflection point. I had been introduced to clinical research through one of my mentors, and that was new. I hadn't really thought about clinical research. I had, you know, in my summers in college and in med school, I had worked in a lab. I needed more engagement with other people instead of with samples and machines. But when I learned about clinical research and just saw the possibilities that that could open up about driving impact at a population level, I thought, this is cool. This is something I want to do more of because this really just opens up a whole other world of possibilities. You know, as a clinician, you're really just focused on each individual patient one at a time. The relationships are incredibly um, intimate, especially as an OBGYN. They're very personal and they're they're very rewarding. But then after a while, you're like, wow, there's only so many patients that I can see. There's only so many like C-sections I can do, <laughs> only so many surgeries I can perform, so many pap smears I can do. Like if I really want to make a difference, I, I got to think bigger. And so so the whole concept of clinical research just kind of opened that up for me. So that took me to to working in pharma. Uh, it was it was not hard to go from a, a clinical research study that was sponsored by a pharmaceutical organization to just working directly in pharma. And so that was a really great transition. It was very different, steep learning curve for sure. Had to learn a whole new kind of field and industry, but worked with really great people who were willing to spend their time and help me to understand what I needed to understand. It's been quite a, it's been quite a journey for sure. Thank you for that. Um, and that sounds really interesting. I'm kind of curious about the difference between the academic research where you said you were stuck in a lab by yourself and clinical research. Is there, I would just like the audience, I would personally like to know that. And then the audience, then I'll ask the next question. I had the opportunity to work in like two or three different labs, uh, th you know, like in med, 
med school or people who are, want to go to med school are like, oh, you got to go work in a lab, right? Because <laughs> it seems like just the thing to do. Um, and so fortunately, I was able to have those opportunities. I remember the first lab experience I had was preparing calcium ATP specimens from dog cardiac tissue. So it was really, I mean, it was really interesting. I learned a lot about that. I learned I don't like working with dogs because dogs are too close to being humans friends. I also came to appreciate, you know, like the the behind the scenes work that happens to to bring science to life. So, but it is a lot of time where you're just working in a lab by myself, not really talking to other people. And I found it a bit isolating. So it wasn't, I, I knew like it wasn't for me per se because of that, but I certainly developed an appreciation for it. And then I had the opportunity to work in a pharma company in a lab setting. And there was slightly more people working in that context and learned a lot there about the science and the work that was being done. But also, you know, at that level of your career, there's limits as to what you're really going to be involved in or what you can be engaged in because you're pretty junior on the on the chain. And so, yeah, so I did a lot of <laughs> similar kind of work, like, you know, preparing specimens and like um, pipetting stuff from, from here to there. And I knew how to use all the machines and all that. But uh, after a while, it was kind of like, okay, I've had, you know, I've learned what I can learn here. <laughs> Talk about the women's health. Like what were you doing in environments like that, that started that you, that you felt that you started to have a greater impact? Yeah, well, that's quite a journey. Um, so I started off um, working in in menopause. Actually, that was one of my first projects, being the lead, clinical lead for a study in menopause. And I learned a lot about menopause. <laughs> I learned that it's a very underserved condition. I learned that all women go through it because of our biology. That's just the way it is. Um, and I learned that we actually don't know much about menopause and why people have some people have symptoms um, and others just transition without any issues. And so it was a really amazing experience. There were so many people super passionate working in this space. Not all of them are coming from the same fields. There's people coming from like neuroscience research, cardiovascular research, gastrointestinal, psychology, mental health, you know. And so it was a really interesting um, combination of experts that were quite vocal in this area. I will just add that the timing was such that it was shortly after this very pivotal large trial had um, released early results, uh, the Women's Health Initiative trial, that really had huge and long-lasting impact. So the trial was looking at um, hormone replacement for menopausal women, looking at both estrogen alone and then estrogen plus progesterone for women who had uteri. And the trial was halted early because there were findings that in the um, estrogen plus progesterone arm, there was increased rates of breast cancer. And so there was a lot of discussion and analyses happening to try to make sense of it all. I, th I think fast forward 20 some odd years, and I think we've got a better feeling about what that trial did and did not show. The long lasting impact of that trial is people became very phobic about using hormones. And um, there was a lot of push to, to look at natural using air quotes here, natural treatments for uh, menopausal symptoms and in general, just a desire to go back to a more natural and same thing, air quotes, <laughs> to approach health from a more natural perspective, whatever that means. And there were slightly different and, and it's not well defined what that means. It's probably a little bit different for each and every person. But but yeah, that was like a really uh, interesting time to be in the industry and to be in women's health. Can I just interject there for a second? Yeah, I absolutely. Can imagine I actually... Um, I was working at an agency in that period in advertising healthcare, and we were working on the five, what's today's Pfizer's brand. It was YS Premarin, yes. and that was when the study came out. Yes, and it was a massive. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> suddenly, and to be honest with you, yeah, because um, I, I'll, I'm just going to say this out loud. I'm post menopause, and that scared the bejee. I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. But interestingly, I've been interviewing yep. all of these um, gynecologists, you know, who are NAM certified menopause experts, and they are huge believers in yeah. it. So I think it's so interesting your timing to have yep. been in that and yep. now where you are today to see it at sort of the other side. But anyway. Yeah. I the pendulum has definitely swung the other way. Yeah, I think, but it's taken a while to kind of unpack the findings from that study. And absolutely for 
people who, you know, women who have symptoms, hormone therapy remains the most effective way to address those symptoms. So that's kind of the short answer to the long, long, very long story. But it, but it's, I think it's really wonderful that um, the pendulum has swung back the other way that people are now looking and are open to using hormone therapy and also thinking about women's health just more holistically and what can be done to, to optimize the health for women. And, and thank you for sharing that. After you worked on the menopause, what happened after that? Those years, uh, Wyeth were interesting because we the, Wyeth got acquired by Pfizer. <laughs> so I went through my very first uh, pharma acquisition. It was a challenging time for sure. Just a lot of things changing. For anybody who's gone through any kind of acquisition, they can relate to this. Came out on the other end without too much issue and then ended up working for Pfizer for a few more years and continued to work across women's health indications, um, supporting neuroscience did adult and pediatric research, which was which was really great. It's like a different set of regulatory requirements, but also very similar in terms of like, you know, stringent trial conduct. From there, I was recruited to go work at Bayer, which is also a company that has a large women's health portfolio and spent six years at Bayer in late stage clinical development, um, working across several indications in women's health, as well as a couple outside of women's health, which is okay. It was all great opportunities for learning. And it's just a very different company. It's based in Germany. It's like a German feel. Uh, the colleagues were very European, um, got to travel and worked on both drugs and medical devices, which are a little bit different. And then from there, I got recruited to work at J&J &J in a corporate team. It was a little bit different. Um, it was in the office of the chief medical officer. And we were sort of like a startup. I mean, J&J is a massive company, but the, the team was new. And so we were like a small startup and it was fun. It was hard. We worked really hard because we were trying to figure out what we wanted to be as a team. Uh, so we went through all of that. We had to define our strategy. We had to figure out who our customer was, you know, but we did some really great things. Uh, we did set up a forum for Johnson & Johnson Pregnancy and Lactation um, Group, and it was an internal resource for teams across the enterprise if they had questions about doing clinical trials with pregnant individuals or lactating individuals, um, they could come to our team for um, consultation. We had like 12 specialties represented from like toxicology to legal to safety to regulatory. We have patient advocacy represented. So we really tried to provide holistic support as, as teams were thinking through their needs for trials in these areas. And while I was at j, &J we also started to dive into this whole concept of women's health as not just bikini medicine, which are is the traditional definition where women's health is... Um, you know, the parts of the body that would be covered by bikini. So uh, breast and pelvic organs and conditions that affect those body parts, but really thinking about women's health more holistically. Um, the fact that, you know, actually there are differences, there's sex differences between males and females because our cells are different at, you know, at the cellular level, you know, so every cell actually has a sex. And so it seems not illogical that females might respond differently to drugs and treatments than males. And it really has not been looked at. It's considered a newer area of, of medicine for sure. And which, which is really fascinating. And, and it's cross cutting. It's across every single uh, therapeutic area and disease. Um, and so it's really thinking about women's health, um, not as women only conditions, but conditions that affect women differentially or disproportionately. And then of course, uniquely. So, and there's Lots of really interesting research there. And as I continue in my journey and speaking to people, you can see that not everyone is has that level of awareness too. So there's there's just so much happening in that space and it's really exciting to be a part of it. But um, yeah, so that was another part of the work that I did at Johnson & Johnson. And then I would say the third kind of big aha moment there was around working in uh, public health settings. So we our team had... Um, noticed that there was an issue with the maternal mortality rates in the U.S. and that the rates are, you know, and this was several years ago, and so it, it's the trend has continued, but that the maternal mortality rate in the U.S. is actually higher than other developed nations that we would benchmark to, especially when you think about how much we spend in our economy on healthcare. And then when you double click on it and look behind the surface level numbers, 
what you see is that actually two thirds or three quarters, depending on the year of the report of those deaths are actually preventable which is shocking. And then uh, when you look at the women who are affected by race, there's racial inequities. So women of color are experiencing maternal mortality at rates three to four times higher than that of white women. And it really begs the question why. So um, so our team became very um, involved in in like some initiatives to see what what could be done to to kind of, you know, address these inequities and to, and also to just raise awareness too. So we became like a bit of a consultative expert team within our organization. And we were asked to give input to other teams and um, health equity, I think, uh, the, you know, keep in mind this, these were the George Floyd years during COVID. And so people started to have this awareness that not everybody is living the same experience and people from different races, especially people of color are having a different experience than than people who are in the majority race. So made for very interesting conversations for sure. So you were an entrepreneur in a, <laughs> but I think what's interesting in, in that situation is you just become so vested because you're creating something from the ground up. And I think that sounds like a very interesting, you know, I don't know how many years you were at J&J, but like just the way you were able to grow that and then have those that, you know, the public health initiative around maternal mortality rates, the fact that you were able to dive and delve into these different areas would mm -hmm. make really interesting experience, you know, and sort of the desire hard to want to leave that as long as you feel you're growing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but I mean, I will say every, every step along the way, I've continued to learn and grow. I think I do have a lot of intellectual curiosity. And I always mm -hmm. tell people that I'd rather be dead than be bored because I want to be constantly <laughs> stimulated. I want to be thinking about things. I don't, I don't want to sit still. I don't want to just like sit back and say, you know, enough. I want to just keep going as, as long as I can <laughs> until I can't. <laughs> so you said that during, you were still at J&J during the pandemic. So how long have you been with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? And how is that experience like coming along? Yeah, so I joined the foundation um, January of 2023. So it's been a year and uh, two two or three months. Um, and so so I have not been there that long. I, I was recruited to uh, lead a team that sits within a new division. So not only new team, but we're in a new division and the division is called gender equality. And the idea behind the creation of the division is the foundation has always strove to make advances in gender equality, but, but the teams and the work doing the gender equality advocacy and, and, and product development kind of sat in different areas of the organization. And so the idea is by pulling it all into one place, it gives it more heft, a, a stronger voice. And also the investment dollars are able to be more strategically leveraged to move the needle for gender equality. And so within gender equality, we have health teams and non-health. So I lead a health team. We also have what we call upstream kind of R&D teams and downstream, which is more like program implementation teams um, that work directly in the countries with, with the country offices. And then we also have non-health teams. We have a data team. We also have a um, women in economic empowerment, women in leadership. And then there's a team called uh, Gender Norms Learning Agenda. And that's looking at adolescents because we see that girls who become women. And in many of these uh, countries that we do work in, they're getting married at very young ages and becoming mothers at young ages. And so we're, we're looking at the gender equality applies to both girls and women. So it's not just women as we would classically think of them. So, so how has it been? It's been super exciting. It is, like I said, it's a new team. So <laughs> sounding familiar, a little bit more of that startup mode, kind of defining what we want to be as a team, which is my last role in a way uniquely prepared me for this role. And so just kind of defining that out, building out the team. Um, our team is both an R&D as well as a product introduction team, because it doesn't do any good to develop a cool product if it can't actually get to the people that you're trying to drive change for. And so uh, that product introduction is an important part of the, the team, the team's work. So we're kind of across the value chain um, and we are heavily matrixed because the team was created from work that um, either 
was ongoing, but sat under a different team's accountability, or maybe it's a newer area altogether of investment that all got pulled together into, into my team. So we are framing women's health as a gender equality issue, which it absolutely is, because um, when we think across the lifespan and the conditions that they're not all conditions, but they're health issues or health initiative areas that can disproportionately uh, impact women or in some cases uniquely uh, impact women. So things like pregnancy are uniquely impacting uh, women and girls. But like, uh, for example, sexually transmitted infections, it's not just a woman or girl only problem, but there's can be a differential impact because of the long-term outcomes that, that happen with uh, STIs that can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, adverse pregnancy outcomes, that kind of thing. Um, and then I'll just say contraception, also not a woman and girl only problem, but uh, historically there's most of the products are women controlled or women administered um, for contraception. And from an equity standpoint, and also from like empowerment standpoint, I think that continues to be a very important um, way to frame uh, contraceptive access. Although there is some very cool research coming out with um, male controlled methods as well. So, I mean, it's all good for the field, so for sure. But uh, but it's been super exciting. I've had a chance to build out my team. It's learning every single day. <laughs> and uh, But it's been fun and it's really, I think, you know, what makes me excited every day is just thinking about the ability to drive impact and it's just an unprecedented opportunity. So I'm really excited. Wow, that sounds fascinating. And it's sounds like it's going to be really interesting to watch what you're able to do. And of course, with everything that's going on in women's health, do you want to talk about your perspective on that? Yeah. So, I mean, so thanks for all of that, Elizabeth. I do feel like, you know, we opened the conversation about the Women's Health Initiative study 20 years ago and how that was just such a negative impact on uh, the innovation that was taking place in women's health and a lot of the excitement and it's taken really about 20, 20 plus years for the pendulum to come back the other way. And honestly, I think for a whole generation of people to enter into the field and to bring their energy and um, passion to the space and to question the status quo. So I'm really excited. I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> I tend to be a little bit more cautious of a person, um, but I'm cautiously optimistic about where it will go. And just the amazing um, initiative coming out of the White House and with led by Dr. Jill Biden around women's health R&D and the commitment to funding in this space is terrific because actually when you look at women's health globally, the largest funder for women's health R&D is the NIH, the US NIH, Nas National Institutes of Health. And the second largest funder is actually the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we we need more funding. We need more people to come into the space. We also need partnerships, collaboration, because this is too big of a thing to for one organization. I mean, the US government is huge, but it's not enough. We need collaborations, partnerships. We need people working together to, to really problem solve and to think about what is possible and to come up with creative solutions. Over half the world's population is women and we can't just leave women behind. Women are marginalized and not heard and it's only now becoming obvious and more, there's just now more awareness is being uh, gained in this area. And so we need everyone to be aware of this because it's going to be really important. Uh, you know, th what they say is who does the work shows up in the work, right? Mm -hmm. And so we really need women as stakeholders. We need them at the table. We need them at the bench. We need them in the lab. We need them in the clinic. We need them making policy. We need them driving change. We need them at every point along the way. Oh, I think that's, I love what you just said. Um, we need women to show up. And I think it's interesting, as I had mentioned that I was interviewing um, a, an OBGYN yesterday, and she talked a lot about, because we talked about, well, how, what do you see in the future? And she said, basically, it's the need for everybody to show up. But what she said, what, and, and she's um, in her early 60s, and I only cite that because she was, you know, she went through the whole, the whole WHO um, initiative and all of that. And she's a pers big prescriber of HRTs. I'm saying that because what she said was, she said in her time, she remembers, you know, 12 years ago being, or maybe even more being at this conference and she called it that, that it was a mantle versus a panel. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I never heard of that. I was like, yeah, yeah. 
but but what she said was now when she goes it's primarily women in the field and so i think that seeing that we real, need both yeah <laughs> yeah we definitely we definitely need both because they're going to bring different things to the table but i think what's what what my learnings have been more recently is just seeing that you know women physicians are also are, are also patients they're also going through the very experience so they have they have literal empathy. They're not, they don't have the yeah. talking about it empathy, which is more like compassion. They're actually walking in the shoes because they've experienced it, whether they've had any of those symptoms or you know they've gone through the various life stages. So I think it's it puts them in a unique position to yes. be able to really talk about it, you know, mm -hmm. and really show up with a more than a point of view. Um, if they if they go into the field, really make change because they know what's needed and they, they feel the unmet needs. So I'm kind of curious of, on your thoughts. I mean, I think, you know, you, you, that was a great answer what you just said, but like in terms of unmet needs, like if you were looking into the future, what, where do you feel you would want to be with unmet needs filling? I think, you know, if we, in medicine, they teach us this head to toe approach. It's, I think it's just like a mental framework. So you don't forget anything, but if we start with the head, mental health, I think continues to be an area that doesn't get enough attention in the context of women's health in almost every chronic condition. If you look at men compared to women, uh, women experience more anxiety and depression than men. And I'll give you one example with psoriasis. That's actually a, a, an autoimmune disease or immune mediated condition that's slightly more, I think, slightly higher prevalence in men than in women. Uh, but when you look at trials where men and women have the same amount of skin involvement of their um, psoriasis, women actually report higher rates of anxiety and depression um, and greater impact on their quality of life than men. And that's just one condition, you know, and so who knows how many other conditions are out there that people haven't like looked at it in quite that same way. So mental health, without a doubt. And then I'll say specifically, you know, for adolescents and teens, I think that's an age group where there's a lot of vulnerability. Um, and then I'll also call out that during pregnancy, so we, you know, people have probably heard of postpartum depression, but I think it's actually perinatal depression. So it's around the time of pregnancy because people are usually depressed before pregnancy. And then after the pregnancy, they're vulnerable to um, falling back into that afterwards. Or the people who have experienced postpartum depression, when you ask them about it in more detail, you realize actually they had depression, just maybe not diagnosed even prior to pregnancy. So, so those are two uh, life points where, where mental health, I think is especially critical and just more attention could be paid and more more information could be shared around that in terms of resources and what to do. Continuing down with the head to toe analogy, I think, you know, one area that my team is working on a lot is around contraception. And that you might take it for granted because it, contraception, uh, the pill has been around for decades, but it's not perfect. There's plenty of women who don't where it just doesn't work for them or they have side effects that limits their ability to tolerate it. There's of course other methods, but there's actually not a whole lot of novel development happening in that space. So considering the number of people who I think the last estimate I saw was like it's around 220 million people have women have unmet needs for contraception or their their need for contraception is not being met. And that seems like a lot of people. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's one area where I think we, we probably could do more as an unmet need. Maybe a third area that's not really a condition per se, but it's just around health literacy and awareness. I think a lot of what women experience is with our internal organs, like because our biology as such, our reproductive organs are inside our bodies. And so it's like shrouded in mystery. There's taboo. People don't talk about it. You can't see it. I remember a friend of mine who had an abnormal pap smear and she ended up needing um, treatment for cervical dysplasia. And it was just so hard to like even talk about it because, and this is a college friend of mine. So, you know, educated and very informed, but it was just difficult to even have a conversation about it because it's, you know, you can't see your cervix. It's inside your body. What's pre-cancer? You know, people don't really know what that is. <laughs> and it's like, it's not cancer, but it's pre and it's got cancer in it. And so people know cancer is bad. And so, yeah, so that, that, that is, I think, health literacy. And then it starts actually with girls and think, uh, talking about periods. A lot of girls just don't know what a normal period is. And you hear these stories about, um, you know, there's so many examples out there, but like women who are ultimately diagnosed with endometriosis or fibroids, they have had terrible periods for 
decades. They just didn't even know. They thought it. They thought it was normal, right? But then they realized later it was not normal. And so, I think we have to just talk about what's happening and destigmatize it. Just make it part of normal. It's biology. It's it's normal part of you know uh, human experience as a female to have a period. And I think if there was just more open conversation about it, it would kind of accelerate the awareness and then um, improve health literacy. Schools could do more for sure. Conversations at home could do more, but a lot of times parents don't know anymore either because they went to the same school system. (laughs) And um, I'm not saying it's all in the schools either. I'm not sure where the gap is. I'm sure at every level more could be done, but I think generally just increasing health literacy will help patients to be stronger partners in their care and to participate in decision making um, around care decisions. So those are a few that come to mind. There are more, of course, but I think those are the top ones for today. All of these things are so kind of overwhelming. So it makes sense with the mental health. I love that as an unmet need. And yes, we need to, to do a lot about that. The health literacy is a great one, Rue. And I'll tell you why. I've heard so much. I've been doing all these interviews and having conversations. And the number one thing that's come up with both the women. So I've spoken with girls 12, 13, you know, who are getting their periods, who are going through puberty, adolescence, around sexual health, up through reproductive years and and perimenopause, menopause and post. And all of the women, not physicians, the women have said, we need to, we need to destigmatize. We need to take, make this not a taboo topic. We need to make, you know, people feeling, women feeling comfortable about having the conversation And the physicians said, we need to be able to educate, but we don't have time to educate. The system doesn't set up to have these nuanced conversations. And so I think it's just so fascinating because they're not going to get time. They'll probably get less time, but we need to add that layer of education in there because they talked a lot about the health literacy, women really not understanding their bodies. And so, you know, and when and where that could go in. So I think that's it. I thought those are three really excellent unmet needs uh, that, that you spoke to. So um, this has been such an interesting conversation and we could go on forever. I have one last question for you. Um, here you have an opportunity, Rue, to give a message to women around the world of all ages, of all backgrounds and of all cultures. What do you want to say to them? First and foremost, I would say you are not alone. You are not alone. Whatever you are experiencing, you are not alone. There is another woman out there who has experienced it, or if you have a question about something, some other woman has had the same question. So you are not alone. Reach out in whatever way you feel comfortable to other people who can give you support and confidence and um, and just make you feel heard because I guarantee you, you are not alone. That is, that's one thing. And maybe the second message would be just uh, don't be afraid to try something new or to challenge yourself or to go in a different direction. You never know. Life is crazy. There's all kinds of twists and turns. And you you sometimes don't know where, where things are going to, what sequence of events is going to take place and, and take you to, to where you, you end up going. And that's probably where you were meant to be. So just be open-minded about that and don't be, uh, embrace embrace change and take the opportunity to try something new. Um, Thank you so much for getting under the hood with me today, uh, for sharing your story with women around the world. Thanks for listening to Under the Sisterhood. If you haven't already, please give us a quick rating and review on Apple or Spotify. And make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn so you can hear from more amazing women. This podcast is created and hosted by Under the Sisterhood LLC, and Elizabeth Elfenbein, produced by Elizabeth Elfenbein and Matt Butler, and edited by Matt Butler. The music is by Ayla Schaefer, her song, Rose. 